Welcome back. In this segment, we're going to talk about bacterial infections. So the characteristics of bacterial infections as a group are that they are in general curable with antibiotics. Some of them have started to develop antibiotic resistance, but in general, we have at least our you know, granddaddy of all antibiotics that can cure a bacterial infection. The transmission is through bodily fluids and bodily fluids that are held within mucous membranes. So on average, women are twice as likely to become infected as men are because it's much more common for women to have their mucous membranes exposed to someone else's bodily fluids that can contain bacterial infection. And so um, it's one of those biological unfairness issues where women are twice as likely to become infected as men are. Areas that are most likely to be affected are the vagina, but the throat and the anus can also be infected by um, bacterial infections. And so sometimes people who have um, throat problems that they think are like post-nasal drip from, an from allergies or something, it could actually be a bacterial infection. Um, and then with the anus, it can also, being a mucous membrane, can absorb the bacteria and, and transmit the infection that way. With bacterial infections, condoms are generally really effective because if you keep the bodily fluids away from the mucous membranes, you're gonna prevent the infection. Um, when left untreated, bacterial infections can progress to the point where they damage the fallopian tubes or the, va the vas deferens, and that can lead to sterility in men, men and or women. Um, it also, it left untreated, if a person doesn't notice the symptoms and, and the infection is progressing um, rapidly and, and unchecked, it can actually cause sepsis, which can kill the person. And um, one of the number one killers annually is just general bacterial infections that become septic, not specifically um, sexually transmitted bacterial infections, but bacterial infections in general. Um, a lot of times we don't give enough credit to the bacteria for its ability to actually kill us. So um, we don't, we want to be able to notice the symptoms as early as we possibly can so that we can get treated quickly and um, reduce the risk of losing our fertility and or dying from the infection. So let's talk a little bit about the uh, different bacterial infections and some of the symptoms that are associated with it. I'm going to talk about chlamydia and then also gonorrhea on this slide. And I got this information from PlannedParenthood.org. So if you want to follow up with more detail. So chlamydia is a, a really common bacterial infection. And uh, this, the unfortunate part about it is that almost 90% of people who are infected with it do not notice their symptoms. Um, for men, the symptoms that are most commonly noticed are a milky discharge from the urethra. And for men, when there's, um, you know, any kind of, fluid coming out of the urethra that is not urine or semen, they, they tend to notice it. So when it has advanced enough that there's a milky discharge, that's something that men typically will notice. They also will notice if they're experiencing swollen or tend tender testicles. It uh, oftentimes is actually literally the epididymis that's hurting, um, but that kind of pain will oftentimes drive a man to the doctor to find out what's wrong. Women tend to most commonly complain about swelling inside the vagina. What that means is um, the vagina feels tender, sore. They might experience bleeding after intercourse because the vagina is um, you know, being infected by the bacteria. And so it's um, making like little tiny micro fissures all over the vagina. It makes it painful and um, prone to bleeding. Gonorrhea is another bacterial infection that's transmitted through um, bodily fluids. 40% of women do not notice the symptoms of gonorrhea and 10% of men do not notice the symptoms. So what we're seeing is that gonorrhea is much more likely to be noticed by the person who's infected than chlamydia is. For men, the most common symptom is a yellowish green discharge from the urethra. Um, for women, it's not just the vagina that feels swollen, but actually all the vulva, like the, ex the external genitalia feel swollen and tender. They may progress to uh, enough of an infection that they actually experience vomiting, throwing up um, as a symptom. And if you're at the point where you're vomiting from a bacterial infection, you're, it's progressed. Some common things that women will report, whether it's chlamydia or gonorrhea, are a lot of pretty vague ex um, you know, descriptions. Abdominal pain 
bleeding between periods, low-grade fever, painful intercourse, painful urination, an urge to frequently urinate, um, a yellow-green vaginal discharge. Um, they, women across both of these types of bacterial infections will report these kinds of symptoms, and uh, women across lots of different contexts would report these symptoms also, and that's the thing that makes it really difficult. Is it an infection, or is it endometriosis, or is it you know, something else? So um, the, the uh, woman oftentimes will present with very vague symptoms, and the only really reliable way to know is to actually um, have a swab and um, you know, be, be diagnosed, right? So actually get an STD test and, and get diagnosed. Um, we call it a differential diagnosis. You know, just get swabbed and find out so that if it's not an STD, we can go down a different route. All right, now under bacterial infections, we also have syphilis. And syphilis is, um, I need you to brace yourself. I'm gonna show you a picture real quick. Um, it's when we have a, a bacterial infection that manifests itself in these, what are called shankers, these sores that um, weep. They oftentimes will, will rupture and then fluid will come out of them. Um, and that's usually the symptom that causes a person to want to see a doctor because they're like, what is this, right? Um, what happens is that this little spirochete who looks so cute in that little cartoon um, is able to um, jump from that shanker into somebody else's um, skin, right? And enter their bloodstream through that entry. And it's designed like a little corkscrew so that it can like drill itself into the, um, into the flesh and that's how it's transmitted. Um, it turns out that the spirochete can actually transfer from the mom uh, to her unborn baby during gestation. And so babies can actually be born with um, syphilis. And so let's talk a little bit about what, the, what happens when a person is infected with syphilis. It goes through stages sort of analogous to those stages that we talked about with um, HIV. Uh, so first off, there's the primary infection, which is that period of time when the person has just recently been exposed to the spirochete, and they will experience a chancre wherever that spirochete entered their body. So it's generally going to be somewhere in the, in the genitalia. It could be in the mouth. Um, it could be in the anus. But, you know, a lot of times, uh, you know, it's noticed more by a person who has a penis, right, because it's easier to see it. Um, the vagina might just feel like there's something like something's wrong, but it might be hard to see exactly what it is. Um, but that chancre is our primary symptom. During secondary syphilis, um, the spirochete infiltrates the body and starts, um, you know, activating different sy systems of the body, infiltrating these different parts of your body. Generally, during the secondary phase, there will be a rash that emerges all over the skin, on the mucous membrane, so in your mouth and in your vagina or anus, like it'll be everywhere and then it goes away and you enter the latent phase. The latent phase, it, it can last years and this is a period of time where the person doesn't display any more symptoms of anything being wrong, but they're contagious. So now the spirochete has entered their body and is, is um, getting into their you know, vaginal secretions or into their, um, into their sperm. It's getting, you know, right, it's, it's infiltrating and um, is able to be transmitted but isn't necessarily causing any outward sign in the person who has it. This is really an important stage to think about because uh, back in, you know, antiquity, um, you know, when researchers were trying to figure out how syphilis progresses, they were really perplexed by the latent phase. Um, it seems like you're over it, and then for years nothing happens, and then, you know, finally some other symptoms will start to emerge, and we'll talk about that in a second. That latent phase is how this um, infection is able to spread so well through a population, right? Because the person who has syphilis has no idea that they do, but they're highly contagious and they can pass it along. Um, so it's um, a really scary infection because a person maybe doesn't notice their chancre because it's in a part of their body maybe they can't see or something, and it does go away. So you're like, well, that was weird, and then it goes away, right? And then you get a rash on your body and you're like, man, was I out in the sun too much? Or did something bite me? Or did I come in contact with a poison ivy or a whole bunch of other excuses that you might come up with for why you're having this symptom? 
and then it goes away. And then you seem to be fine for years and years. Um, then you enter the tertiary stage. Some time later, you enter the tertiary stage, and, the, and it manifests in one of three ways. Um, there's the benign tertiary stage, which is where it only affects your, your skin, your bones, your ligaments. And I say only in quotation marks. I know you couldn't see me, but um, it only affects skin, bones, and ligaments, which means it, it's probably not going to kill you, but it's going to be, for example, disfiguring. Here's a person who has benign syphilis and it's emerged on his face. I, mean, I think we can all agree that that's not that benign, is it? I mean, can you imagine having that on your face? So benign is in, you know, relative to the other things that, that this spirochete can do to you. It also affects bones and ligaments though. And so a person can start to have what they think is like arthritis or um, they might have a loosening of their ligaments that allows their joints to dislocate sort of, you know, really easily. And they don't know necessarily why they're having this effect. They think, oh, it's just because I'm aging or something like that, when in fact it's actually tertiary syphilis. The cardiovascular and the neurosyphilis, now those are, we can not, never call that benign. You will die of these. So with the cardiovascular, it's going to attack, attack your heart, your lungs, you know, the cardiovascular system. Neuro, it's going to cause strokes, heart attacks, things like that, that ultimately will end a person's life. Um, with neurosyphilis, it's going to attack the brain and the spinal cord. And so you can end up with paralysis or nerve damage. Um, you can end up with sensory um, anomalies where maybe you suddenly lose your sense of smell or taste or um, maybe lose part of your color vision or other kinds of things that um, you know, seem kind of random, but they are attributable to what the spirochete is doing to the brain, ultimately um, killing the person with the neurosyphilis. Um, we've had uh, um, one of our classic examples of unethical, cruel behavior um, in researchers ties back to syphilis. Um, back in the 40s, they were doing a study of black men in the South in Tuskegee, Alabama, who uh, government researchers established had syphilis. They did not tell the men that they had syphilis, but instead offered them free medical care. We'll come down every year and we'll, you know, give you a full physical and all these things. And it's going to be a great benefit for you. And did not tell them they had syphilis, did not tell them to protect their partners, um, didn't say anything and just followed the progression of the disease. And of course, it gets even more mal malignant when we talk about the fact that about 10 years into the study, um, antibiotics were developed and antibiotics will end a syphilis infection. Um, and they didn't offer it to the members of this so-called study. So um, it was a very dark period in research. Uh, they have had studies like this discovered in lots of different countries around the world um, where they've studied people who have low IQs and expose them to syphilis and then see how it progresses. And, and once antibiotics were invented, there was no need to be doing any of that. Um, but researchers have, um, have done that just sort of... Um, gratuitously, I think we would argue. Uh, so the thing I want to leave you with, though, is that both gonorrhea and syphilis have started to have um, antibiotic resistant strains, where um, a person takes a course of antibiotics that normally should end gonorrhea or should end the syphilis infection, and they it doesn't work for them. Um, and so they have to take another round or a stronger antibiotic. And so we're really worried that if we get to the point where one of these two bacterial infections is resistant to the granddaddy of all of our antibiotic treatments, uh, we're going to be in trouble. Um, so protecting against infection is the number one thing to do for all of these um, you know, bacterial infections. Condoms work really well. So condom use is really important. Now, our last category of STI would be the parasitic STIs, and there's really only two I'm going to talk about. Um, in the body, there's trichomoniasis, which uh, is a amoeba type of creature that causes discharge from the urethra, male or female, causes dis discharge. Um, so here's the little amoeba guy who causes it. And you tend to get it through um, tainted water and things like that, but then it can be transmitted sexually through semen and bodily fluids. So this would be treated with antibiotics. Um, and then we have on the body, everyone's favorite pubic lice. 
and you know a lot of people call this crabs for obvious reasons when you see a picture of it it looks a lot like it could be a crab um, and pubic lice are just like lice on the head which nobody wants that either um, but they are treated with you know uh, pesticide type of shampoo that will kill them and of course you have to go through a second round because they've laid their eggs at the base of the hair in this case pubic lice prefer the warm dark area that is the pubic region and so they latch onto the hair follicles the pubic hair and lay their eggs at the base of the pubic hair um, you know right at the follicle and so when their eggs hatch you got to give them another dose of the pesticide before they get to make their own babies and so, yeah, it's really gross and nobody likes it. And, um, you know, there's so much stigma and things attached to all sexually transmitted infections. Um, and, you know, I think lice in general, I think there's, a, you know, with head lice, there's an assumption that it's, you would get head lice because you're dirty or something. And it turns out that's not really what causes pubic lice, right? They are just little parasites that attach to us, suck our blood and lay their eggs. It's, um, you know, opportunistic. Uh, but there's so much stigma attached to anything that is sexually transmitted that it makes um, it more difficult for people to seek out treatment when they, uh, even when they have something that's very treatable. Um, so hopefully with this lecture, you've gotten a little bit more confident about, you know, the causes, the treatments, the symptoms of all these different kinds of STIs, you know, the best ways to prevent it. I mean, even though, um, you know, genital warts or herpes or even um, shankers could be, you know, um, spirochetes of syphilis could be transmitted through contact with the skin and therefore um, condoms aren't perfect. You know, if you have the genital wart someplace outside where a, con a condom would protect um, or herpes outside that area or something, um, you could still contract it. You know, you can really limit the likelihood of contracting something by the simple act of using condoms every time. So that's my public service announcement and I will see you guys in the next chapter.